Welcome to the Raise Up Podcast. Hello. I'm Athena. I'm Charlie. And we're so glad that you joined us today. We are just here to like share our entrepreneurial journey and the things that we've learned along the way through our school of life. The hard lessons of life. <laughs> You which know, are easier now. <laughs> they had to be hard in the very beginning. They didn't have to be hard. We just decided we to make them our hard. new line. We didn't know what we didn't know. Exactly. <laughs> That's the best line in the world. You don't know what you don't know. So now we have a little knowledge. So we want to share it with you. Yes. And uh, we have a library of podcasts that we'd love for you to check out at raiseupmindset.com. Or you could answer or drop a question for us on our website. So um, without further ado, the um, topic for today is limiting beliefs. Yeah, um, I think we all have them. Why don't you explain exactly what limiting beliefs are? Well, I have an official definition here that I was going to read for everybody. So I don't have an official definition. I just have what I think I know. <laughs> yes, which he knows a lot, by I the way. I know what so, I know. So um, they're deeply held assumptions or thoughts that restrict our potential. And I think that that probably like you summarizes it. We, uh, I'm sorry. Let me, I didn't hear it very well. Will you say it one more time? I they're, they're deeply held assumptions or thoughts that restrict our potential uh, and that's that, that's a good dead on way i mean it's uh it's it's more of a definition why but yeah i mean you know sometimes we don't realize the potential that we really have and if we don't really let that out there if we kind of have blinders on all the time yeah it's really tough to see everything outside that blinders and yeah i don't know i mean that's uh we all are in a mindset sometimes to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe. And sometimes it really limits what we're going to be able to do and how far we're going to be able to take our company. And I think we're, we, we've kind of broken through that barrier a little bit. Like we, we still take calculated risks, but we're not scared of risk. I mean, we, there has to be good risk for the reward, right? Am I explaining yes, that correctly? Yes, yeah. yes. I, uh, when I think back to earlier in business, the first limiting belief that I think I had to overcome was I can't be the person who generates all of the income that's coming into my bank account. Like I need someone else to show me what to do to help me like organize it kind of like what an employer role does. Sure. People just show up They're They're given the scope. They understand what the requirements are. They're punching a clock and they're paid at the end of the week for that. And that's a safe thing for a lot of people. And Absolutely. what I'm saying, and when we're explaining this, we're not saying this is, applies to everybody. I mean, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. It could apply to everybody that wants to make it apply. If, if, you, if, you're, if you're safe in your bubble, in your area, in your surroundings, and you want to keep it that way, that's perfectly okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you're an adventurous and entrepreneur, you kind of come out, but if you want to be an adventurous entrepreneur, you're going to have to come out of your bubble and you're yes. going to have to come sometimes come out of some unsafe areas because for us to be able to grow, we, we have to, we have to venture out. And if we don't venture out, we're only going to stay in that little bubble and that's as big as we're going to get in that with our company. If you have a belief that you can only make this much money, your belief will only take you to that much money. If you have a belief that you can do 10 million a year, you have a goal, you have a, you have a thing. Make it an attainable goal. Make your first goals, you know, go higher and higher and higher. But once you do that, your goals become unlimited. And then you have to figure out, like we are right now, we're kind of figuring out what we want to take on and what we don't want to take on. Like yeah. this is a low, low, low hanging level fruit for us. But the, the money that we make at it is very low too. So do we want to put that money and energy and time into it? Or do we want to do a little bit higher fruit that gives a lot more return on our investments? And then we can go ahead and make better money money in that. And is it is it a time wise um, something that we want to take on? Is it is it going to take so much of our time that we're going to go ahead and lose that, or are we gaining it? So time and money is always a factor. A factor. Absolutely. And then, and then if it's fun or not too now because yeah, in our timeline <laughs> that's, a, that's now, a thing. <laughs> and then that's the thing too now is now we kind of get to do more fun things. We get to kind of pick and choose things and that that wasn't something that came off right away. Like you know we can choose our clients now and. You know, I remember a long time ago, and I can't remember who had told me this, but like when you can A, tell a client no, or B, fire a client, you're in a good spot. I mean, and when I say that is like, we don't have to work for people that 
are not appreciative and people that don't want to work with us. We, we can choose to work with the people that we want to at a point. Yes. And if it brings a lot of negative energy and it brings a lot of negativity to it, and even sometimes if it brings good money, is it really that good of money? Or can we work for somebody that really appreciates us, that likes us, that wants to pay us what we want to charge, not a Zoom amount, but where we feel that we need to be. And it's a great working relationship. We don't hear from those guys, but every couple of times a year when they come in town, we have dinner with them. It's and much flowing. Yeah, it's flowing. It's, it's, it's a mutually gratifying relationship. There's no blaming on situations. How can we fix it? So we have a lot of those clients now that we work with and we've kind of thinned some of the other ones out. We've kind of like, all right, by nutrition or whatever what it is, we don't have as many of those clients that is a lot of hand-helding. So I think what you're saying is that one of your limiting beliefs early on was that we have to pick everybody. We have 100%. to choose everybody. We have We're taking sitting, everything. We have iron sitting on the ground. We have employees sitting around. It's money revenue coming in because when you are in a belief that you have to take everything on yeah. and no matter what, you're, you're frazzling yourself. You're, you're burning your people out. They're, they're taking trips. You're probably risking some safety factors in there because we have them working so many hours uh, but it's in the legal amount of hours, so yes. it's okay. And now we kind of figure out like, hey, okay, this is one of our great clients and they're asking us something out there. We're gonna go ahead and go above and beyond and work this driver, maybe an 11 hour day today or a 12 hour day, but he's allowed to work 15 hours in a day. In our region. In our region. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna go ahead and do that because this is one of our A customers. But then you get the guy that I was at fault for that would call me at the airport and say, I don't have a way to the cruise ship. Would you please do it? And would you discount this? And I'm willing to pay this. And you know, I had a suburban sitting out front. I'm like, sure, let's take it, you know, because that's revenue we can take in. But yep. the negativity on it and putting that pressure on the driver and time away from his family and then everybody else jumping through some hoops and then the ripple effect of that, and I call it the flower, is it the butterfly effect, mm -hmm. I apologize, is that now my detailers have to make sure they get that deal and clean the next day. Our, our staff has to make sure that they're monitoring that driver until it comes back. That other driver doesn't get a good 12 or 14 hours sleep like he should. He's getting maybe a minimal at eight or nine hours. So the ripple effect of that is for looking for that couple extra hundred dollars making of it, was it really worth it in that yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's one of my limiting beliefs that I feel like I've overcome a little bit. It's like, we don't have to take everything and everything on. We have to take on the ones that we read to. It has to make sense, it has to, it has to flow with us. Um, and even when our partners call us, I mean, like we had a, one of our partners call us last week and needed to help us six motor coaches and we, we made it happen. Yeah. Um, we had a few uh, mishaps on it, but we made it right. We made it happen and we were able to react right away and make it happen. And that's the way we want to operate. Yeah. So the moments when you're put in that, I, I want to say it's not really a crisis mode, but you are selecting those moments when you're in that burst of busyness that you're going to have to hustle a little bit more. And when you are selecting that moment, that it's really maximizing with that relationship, it's, it's worth it financially and the team's on board. It's, um, it's like this, it's a different feel all the way around. It's more of this connection and like, yeah, we're, we're going to get this done and not this, oh, yeah, this is going to be hard. You know, in 24 plus, going on to our 25th year right now, that didn't come right away. No. I mean, this has come in the last four or five years that we're really realizing where we need to be at, where we're at. And... Uh, especially through our pandemic that really reopened our eyes about who we wanted to work with and what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do things. So please, if you're a company that's one or two years old and you've got iron sitting on the ground and it makes sense for you to send that driver out and it makes sense for it, it's got to be it's got to be your own secret sauce. It's got to be a sauce yes. that you're doing. We're just letting you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and you can kind of start picking and choosing your clients and now choosing them earlier. If we would have had some of this knowledge and really somebody would walk through with us, and there was mentors that we had, people that kind of walked us through things and let us know, but like there wasn't this, there wasn't these podcasts or there wasn't these, these uh, YouTube videos that we could really watch as two people that brought a company up from two, two limos and one bus yeah. back in 2000 to the fleet that we have is 100 plus vehicles in our fleet Absolutely. and you know 265 employees. You would have never told me that in 2000 that would have ever happen. We were the limo guys that had a party bus and that was where our MO came from. So it was just like, as you grow within your company, you're gonna find out that there's these opportunities that come up and you wanna take advantage of those opportunities. And the limited belief is sometimes as we're talking about that in that subject is 
we are our limitation. We are our own limitation. It's not the limit that's out there in work and everything else like that. We are the limitation to where we're going to go. And if yes. you can break through that wall and say, I have no limits. I have no things. I want to stay in my lane so I don't get too dry, drifted off. I, I don't want to own a transportation company and all of a sudden a golf course comes up for sale. And I think, wow, that's I an opportunity because they have golf carts and it's in our lane, but it's not, you know, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity and it might be great for investments. It might be other partners. You might be an investor into it, but you got to kind of see in your own little lane or what you know, or what maybe your partner knows and go with that. And then once you start to branch off to different, uh, different fingers, let's call it, uh, of your businesses and you have different income streams, um, one of the things that we're branching off to is STR, short-term rentals, and we're breaking into real estate. So we own homes. We wanted to do it. it we had some great friends, Bill Faith, throwing names out there. In yeah, Bill, Bill and Bria Faith. Bill and Bria, Bria Faith uh, have a great STR program, and they were willing to kind of bring us into it and thought, hey, we can do this. You know, they're, And we have such a great tourism in Alaska that brings in massive people. And even all the, all the hotels, hotels we build, they are always running out of room yeah. and they're looking for places. And what a great opportunity for us to help in that world. And we have rental houses too. So I, I, another thing that we get to do is something like that. So Yeah, but that's kind of like a fun aspect. So it's almost like it's a hobby that brings us revenue, but it's not our main revenue stream. Not at all. And, you know, uh, you were mentioning like overcoming some of these beliefs and something really important that you did mention was staying in your lane. And some people don't know what their lane is. And really it's pick a lane and then start to really learn that craft. So you will find that as you stay in that space, because we have many friends who over the years have dipped into this business and that business and this type of industry. About, and um, it's like, there are people who just absolutely um, they're they're like searching for something when really one of the fortunate things that we had was the fortitude to stick with transportation. And I think that we allowed some of the challenges that we faced to just keep us in that direction, like when we decided to step out of plowing and groundskeeping and then just full fledge with that. So you guys know the quick story of where we started is we used to be employees of employers and then there were some opportunities for us to, for me at least, to do some snow plowing and then I did some snow plowing for friends and I got my own contracts and then I did lawn maintenance contracts and then I got into painting because the people I was doing lawn maintenance and snow plowing for needed help with painters and so it just blew up to these different things. I used to own the ice cream trucks, you're going to laugh about that, I used to have a couple ice cream trucks, one of the highest yielding companies ever for profit margins, like three, four hundred percent margins in those things, it was crazy. But it gave me the platform and the foundation to start building what I'm doing now. And you guys may have not found your lane yet. Maybe yeah. you're still searching for it. Maybe you have some great opportunities to make it. And you know, you have this, when you're really small, you have these great potential growths that you can do that's really high yield because you don't have a lot invested, but you know, it's that gray area that's this huge part. And then you have this like really black area where you're making a ton of money or you're making really good money. And then this, all this other stuff was worth it to get to there. And when I say that is like, um, and I have to give Athena props on this, is like when we were losing some of our contracts for snow plowing, which we had heavily invested in, we had like 20 or 30 plow trucks. We, owned, uh, bat, we had backhoes, we had um, dump trucks, we had all these different sanders, yeah. all these different things. When we realized that we were racing to the bottom on some of these contracts because everybody just kept bidding down, everybody would bring new equipment and this stuff, we were like, wow, our margins are not there anymore. And Athena goes, you know, there's nobody really doing transportation in the limo side of it really well. Why don't we just take advantage of that? We have four or five companies we're competing with, not four or 500. And why don't we do that? And she had the foresight to see that. And I was the limited belief, like, I have my little end point, I'm gonna keep it, and I wanna give this stuff. And then when we just figured out it wasn't worth it anymore, we really rose the company. I mean, it started yeah. rising up fairly quickly. We became the limo people, we became this, and then, you know, kind of just went up from there, then crew transportation, then 
contracts with the governments, all this other stuff started coming up and we're like, wow, you know, this is really a great market area for us to do it. And now being 20 years plus, and I'll say the 20 years into it, is that we really, really started getting into that black car, getting into doing the limos and the uh, transportation world and kind of backing out of CNG services and our other companies. Well, and you know, I think the moral to this story is you don't have to be in transportation to kind of follow along. What happens when you stay in a lane is that you start to you start to get good at that particular aspect of the lane and then you start looking around and seeing other opportunities and i think part of that is because you're no longer in crisis mode and so you're looking for ways to be creative you're looking for optimization and that's where i think that 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 entrepreneur that starts out and gives it like 12 months and then they don't see what they want to see and so they hop into another industry, that's the piece that they miss out on is that you get out of crisis mode, you get a little bit of foundation underneath you and now all of this creative stuff starts showing up and you really start going, wow, and what else can we do? And I think that's what happened to us with each growth spurt. And part of what I felt like my responsibility was when I started to see those opportunities and we decided to take them on together was now what new capabilities do we need to learn in order to manage this well and to get out of that like burst of busyness sort of mini crisis mode that bringing on a chunk of work can put the team in. And usually it's building up the size of the team. It's putting more um, like processes and procedures underneath us and sometimes it's moving to like a higher system that maybe we didn't want to invest in back then when we only were doing this but now we need that system to keep us more organized so I felt like the two of us together that was really the the roles that we played yeah you know I mean I think we both could see the vision of work and work <clears throat> and a thing that super powers are to the processes, the procedures, the, the, the homework on what uh, the systems we need to use, what we're gonna need for employees. And I'm the over eye guy on my like, I, I can see what we're gonna do. I can see this working. I can see like the wheelchair contract when we took that on. I could totally see us taking this on there because we already did wheelchairs in vehicles. So just transporting people, but it takes a vision and it takes other people to work with it. And you have to have that like, okay, we're gonna step into something that we, we don't do a whole lot of it's it's in the airport it's in the grounds and we're going to take this on and we know we can do it it's the first week or two it's just going to be you know it's going to be like learning and figuring out what the the new the nuances Am I and, right? and yeah. also meeting the goals of your clients like you have yeah. to be really clear on why they even want you to do this contract like the, what are the problems that you're solving for them and keep those at the forefront because if you're not <laughs> providing the service that the client absolutely is looking for, then what are we doing here? And I think the opportunities where the theme was saying earlier is that because of our crew contracts, because we really excelled in that, we really realized the, the, the flight attendants and captains only had limited amount of sleep in times between their trips and on-time performance was really important. <clears throat> you, you really have to understand that they look at that and say, wow, yeah. they do so well on that. Would you guys be willing? And that was kind of the answer. Would you guys be willing to take on baggage claim? Would you guys be willing to, what's baggage claim delivery look like? Well, we're already driving people, so it's yep. in our lane as we talk about our lanes. This made sense to us. Now we're gonna put vehicles out, we're gonna pick up bags three or four times a day and deliver them out throughout the state. I mean, throughout anywhere we can really drive. And then on top of that, we were already doing wheelchair services for the other ones. Hey, would you be willing to take on the wheelchair contract? Hey, would you be willing to park airplanes? Ah, oh, we don't really park airplanes, you know, yes. but these are some of the requests that we get that we ask to because we we try to excel in everything that we do and try to do it the best as possible. So people say, hey, I know they don't do this right now, but maybe they'd be willing. And if we taught them, would they be willing to do it? And that's the opportunities you get when you stay in a field, like Athena was explaining, is that we get these opportunities that come to us. Like we didn't even search these things out. I mean, it was yeah. crazy. Like the airport come to us and said, hey, would you take care of the smart carts that we have here because we're having a problem with our vendor? Would you be willing? And we're like, yeah, we, I mean, because we saw the potential of like a six dollars to rent a cart. You just have to put them back in there. You have to maintain the machines. It's we a already deal. had team members. We had team uh, members already roaming there, roaming around the ground. Airport. So. I mean, it was a perfect fit until like 
actually smart cards. And I call them a smart card because that's what they are. They, they blew us out of the water, like bid it four times the amount of money that we were willing to pay for it. But we were jumping in their lane. It was a lane that we totally think we could have took on and it would have fit within our business plan. But this is what they do. I mean, yep. they develop, make their own carts, their own machines, everything. And the funny part is this, is I'm trying to call them to be able to buy carts and machines from them. And he's like, we're bidding against you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, now we got to switch gears. You know, now we got to find another vendor that give this to us. But when you look at them and how big their system is, they knew that business probably well better than we did. And they knew the potential of what they can do in Alaska. And when we looked at the other vendor, it wasn't the potential there. So we thought we had a great opportunity in that. Yep. And I think we'd have done very well at it. I think it would have been good. But the offer was there. That's the part I want to tell you. It's like when you stay in your lane, you work with this group of people, these offers come to you and you're like, that's something I didn't think about. But yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think that entrepreneurs, they allow limiting beliefs to come in and say, oh, this isn't working or you're not going to have enough. And or you get around other humans that are, um, they don't see your vision and they're kind of playing it small and safe in their area. And so they just want you, they love you and they want you to just kind of play it safe and, and don't take a bunch of risks. And so it's, it's really like this balance that you, you work with where you're, you're surrounding yourself around people who are encouraging you, who are not using the tagline, well, I'm just, I'm in reality and you're not, or, or I'm a realist. Really, you have the opportunity to create exactly what you want to create if you have the ability to step into courage and let go of some of those limiting beliefs. And, and I think another limiting belief that we really saw our industry working to overcome, and I think early on we needed to as well, is my rates. I can't raise my rates because my customers aren't going to, um, they're going to leave. They're going to quit me. They're not, they're not going to join me. Yeah. We have so many people in our industry that were so nervous because they were, that was their contract and that was what was keeping them afloat. And they were so scared and look, and we've had some of the same ones in our own companies that we've done early in our lives too. It's like, you know, we can raise them, but we can't raise them that much. And should it be this much, but you're talking about your margins and when your margins, you're playing with your margins and then, is that really your customer anymore? When when you can't get the money that you're doing out of it and, and you can't, you're just paying your bills and you have a job as an you're entrepreneur. You're owning your job. We're not wanting just a job. We're wanting a company. We want to provide a service. We want to be that extra service parts. And you can't do that if your margins are so tight that you can't afford to buy new vans. You can't afford to pay the people what they're worth. You can't expand your operations to yes. a place that it is. As we are expanding, we went from a shop on... 54th and Arvis. We started with a lot. Well, we did. Uh, John's rented us a part of the lot and we had limos outside and we wash them outside the car washes. But when we moved in our first building, yeah. it was huge for us because we had a place to work on vehicles. We had a, there we had an apartment upstairs. We had, we had offices downstairs. We had places to put people and we were smaller, 20, 30 people back then in the yeah. police. And as we grew, we really grew out of that shop and then really moving over to 100th was huge to us. I mean, yes. 8,500 square foot shop, 5,500 square foot uh, offices. I mean, we had this huge space, eight acres to use. And then, you know, the entrrepreneurship of that is people can we park stuff on your yard? Oh yeah, park, park, I don't care. We have yeah. this. That, that was another opportunity. Money. That was then another the opportunity. The led, in, which we had no idea that opportunity was even there. We didn't know parking was such a thing. So uh, what we're trying to say is like, if you're in your in your company now and you think it's a really good company, you have a great service to offer, look at the opportunities around that and how can you build on that? Don't uh, think that this is all you have. Don't let your limited beliefs be the part of it that's holding you back because it's usually not somebody looking for a great vendor. All of us are looking for a good contractor. Dale and Mindy, our contractors, we've kept them busy for the last for, four years. It's, it's not just a building contractor. Like we're, we're looking to team up with people who want the same thing. They want customers that appreciate them, that pay them what they're worth, and that don't bring drama to the scenario. But it's the relationship side of it too. I mean... The relationship that we have with them, that we can call them and talk to them about anything. There's no hard feelings. They can bring us back to reality of what we're looking for and saying, hey, I hear what you want. This is probably not a great fit for this. And that's the, what we look for them and feedback because that's their that's yeah. their skill. That's their superpower is their, 
building, remodeling, and doing things for this. And then we sometimes go, yep, that makes sense. Thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for doing this. But the relationship that we had them, they haven't had the world go out and look for extra work on things because we are able to keep them and the money they want to make and what they're doing. And they've just built and built and built. And so it's been a great working relationship. So I want to just circle back to, is there any particular like limiting belief that you really felt like, gosh, this was one, a big one that I had to step over? Well, I think fuel surcharge. One of those, one of the ones that we were really talking about in the beginning when everybody was not doing it and we were nervous about doing 10%. And I instead think, of raising our rates, we decided to do the fuel yeah, surcharge because initially. Fuel, fuel, if you guys remember, it went up to like $5, five fifty, uh, six bucks a gallon. So we were really nervous because when you were putting your rates in at $3 a gallon, two, three, four, four dollars a gallon, all of a sudden those margins are, and you've got to look at, we currently in the, in the environment now, we're spending almost 12,000 a week in fuel a week. So having that raise up, 20, 30, 40%, you're like, okay, now I'm not making my margins on these that we were doing it because we were expecting it to go 20 or 30 cents, but nothing that was gonna go up so high. So when we did it, it was like, okay, what's gonna be the fallback? And some people are like, what's this 10% fuel surge? But they were so little because remember, we're in Alaska and everything kind of hits a little bit sometimes differently for <clears> us <throat> than it does the lower 48. So like lower 48s always have these taxes and all these other things yeah, we and don't airport have any fees. Of that. And we don't have those things. So when people book things with us, if it's two ninety nine an hour, it's two ninety nine an hour plus maybe there was a gratuity involved to it or whatever else what, it was, it was, but it wasn't a state tax, federal tax, airport tax, you know, um, uh, service rendered tax, hospitality yeah, tax, yeah, where so you don't get tax California, um, you know, twenty five forty percent of what your things were. Uh, I rented a car there and it was sixty nine dollars a day to rent the car, and I walked out at two seventy five a day, and I'm like, how is that even possible? But your guys were taxed to death, so they had to bring the prices down to make it affordable there. For us, when we added the 10% fuel surge. That like, was a concern? Like, it was a little, it was a very big concern of mine and what my customers were gonna see, but once we put it in there, like we had like three or four people said, hey, I don't really appreciate that and I don't like it. Uh, Carrie, which Carrie's one of the people that we worked with, that was like, oh, we're not gonna pay it. I'm like, well, it's not a choice. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, fuel is five or six dollars a gallon. And, and then we went to our vendors and explained it how bad it was. And then we kind of had a floating rate. If the fuel went up to this, this, and this, this is what your percentage was. If it went back down, you didn't have to pay it. So we still made our margins. But the belief to me was, and then after that, I'm like, well, fuel's going up again. We're raising up another 5% because I was over that limited belief that we weren't we're going to lose to, our business. We're not going to lose our business because we were just showing them how we were being good stewards with our money. And we were making sure they were getting the level of service they were getting because we didn't have to compromise that. When you're compromising what you're making, what you're doing, you're cutting corners. And like a builder, if you're looking for a good home builder and you're looking for the cheapest price, it might not be your best home builder. I'm not saying it can be bad. He's gonna meet you where you're. Tr you're lumber is the same price from almost everybody. When you're going to Lowe's, I, you know, you, you might have a little contractor's price or whatever else it is, but lumber's lumber. You know, concrete's concrete. There's hard set prices that these people are making. And if they're gonna do it 25% under the other person, are you gonna get the quality job that you're looking for in a building that I'm gonna live in with my family, my house and everything, that I'm gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not maybe millions, am I gonna get that same quality workmanship? So when we look for things, we look for a good person that's gonna give us good yeah. price and we shop it, but we, want, we don't want the cheapest bidder. I mean, and we don't want the most expensive person, we want the best person. And I guess that's and sometimes it is the most expensive person. 100%. Sometimes it is, and that's okay. And when I'm going to get my gallbladder removed, I'm not looking. <laughs> you're not I'm looking, not, I'm not you're looking not for the Earl for Shy. <laughs> I'm not looking for a Mako paint job. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Renzo. I'm not looking for a person that starts off that they're going to shirt your car for ninety nine ninety five. I want the best surgeon there is yes. because I want to make sure that that's my body. And I think we have to look at that in some of the things that we do is. We have to have the best person doing the best work for us. I'm, when I'm looking for a dental place, I'm not looking for the, the Earl Shy that. I want to make sure that my dental work, because I hate yeah. doing dental work, I want to make sure I'm getting the best possible. So when you're providing that service and you're giving a high level of service, somebody wants to pay for it. And if they don't, they're not your customer. And it, that was the biggest thing we had to realize is like, we don't need a nickel and dime this stuff. Our vehicles cost so much money. Our drivers cost us so much money. Our insurance is there. Why nickel and dime everything? 
it doesn't mean you can't give somebody a good deal. It doesn't mean that you don't bring them in and say, hey, I'm willing to do this. Let me show you what I can do. Then let's raise our prices. You have to build your clientele to a point. But yes. if you're doing the best service possible, you're treating your people good, you're giving them uniforms, you're doing well, you will get the business you're looking for in anything that you're doing, IT, whatever you're doing, car washes. I mean, we have a car wash that's in town and I'm gonna talk about this, has taken over the markets up here. Uh, and I'm just so impressed. They, they recognize their A players and give them vests that show them that they're red and they're leaders. They have the other ones that says new trainers. They talk to you, but they're kind to you, they're nice to you. And it's not like we had bad car washes, but when you realize the level of service you get from one, and then you go back to the other one, you're like, whoa, what am I doing here? I mean, the energy is completely, completely different. Completely different when you walk in that place and it's the same building, same things, different ownership. And the ownership believe we can do. And I'm gonna go back to my favorite place that we talk about is Bucky's gas station. <laughs> Holy sugar. A guy made a gas station into a destination place. Yeah, it's a pretty The vision pretty that man had of like, okay, I'm gonna open a Circle K Holiday Chevron and I'm gonna make it the run of the mill, which all those great places are good places. They're, they, you know, they, they do the job, place. they get you some chips and you get gas there. You go to Bucky's and it's an experience. <laughs> we go to a gas <laughs> station and I'm like been there for two and a half hours walking out with a thousand dollars of the <laughs> shit we didn't need. But we felt good about it because it was cool. Yeah. The experience was there. Like we, a JR and Maria, I'm gonna throw you out there. Maria Gaza with Diamond Limousine. They waited for Bucky to come out in his uniform the to character. get a picture with him. The character, like we were at Disneyland waiting for <laughs> like, no, Mickey Bucky's Mouse coming. to walk out. And he's like, dude, Bucky's coming out in a few minutes. I'm like, I, you're effing kidding me, right? We're gonna wait here, we're gonna wait Bucky to come out. He goes, dude, this guy only comes out like once in a while. And they waited for Bucky and got a picture of Bucky coming out. So that was an experience for them. That was, and you've got to look at what are we doing, guys? I mean, yeah. the limited belief of this guy is thinking that I was just going to have a gas station that had hot dogs and things like that. They're chopping up brisket. They have a beef Fresh jerky sandwiches. bar that is like, like no other. I mean, I bought $175 of beef jerky. I have garlic, beef jerky, pepper, and I'm not promoting them because I get any money for it. I'm telling you that in when I looked at that in the entrepreneurship and what that guy's vision was, it opened up my mind to so many different things like, holy sugar, this guy took this into it. And it, literally, we would look at them. We'd have to pee or go to the bathroom. And we said, would wait to go to Bucky. 65 miles to Bucky. And I'm like, shit, can we make it 65 miles? And then there'd be a billboard that said, you can hold it. And you can do it. And that was the thing that letting them know that you were close to the destination you got to. We passed many other fuel stations that were trying to attract us, but we saw Bucky's as an attraction and they made themselves an attraction. And that, what an incredible company. And I'd love to know the owners and go meet them and talk with them and just their vision because your vision could be the same as theirs. Yeah, and you know, it's not just the experience that the customer was having, it's the experience that the team members were having. You could tell that it was this mutual, like, energy of just they're happy the place is bright it's clean and on the sidewalk there was this... signs it tells them what they're paying yes and what you can make and what your potential was and where do you ever see that where do you have a sign at your place that says hey you can make you're so proud of the fact that you pay your employees so well that you can put a billboard sign out to attract others well there's a line to be a bathroom attendant at bucky's to be able to get it because you're making $19 an hour to do it in a, in a, a BFE town. When I'm telling you, Bucky's doesn't just put their self in like major cities. They're usually on the route somewhere. Way out there. In the middle of nowhere, but people will wait to go there. And when you go there at 1130 at night as we were coming back. Yeah, and you see the we got basketball diverted, team We, we got diverted from, from one of our places in Texas. Texas, you never get to go to your where your scheduled place is because the airlines can't land there. So they land to another town and we had to drive back. 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, there had to be four or 500 people at Bucky's. And in my life, I'm like, what is going on here? And school buses are pulling up with football teams, volleyball yep. teams. They're getting out in droves, walking in there and buying stuff you couldn't buy. And the store looked just as good as it did at yep. two o'clock in the afternoon as it did at one o'clock in the morning. So going back to limited beliefs, guys, it's us. Get out of your head, get out of your stuff that tells you we can't do this. Get into a mindset that you can you can do what you choose to do and how far you want to go. And once you've hit that plateau, hit a new belief, hit a new level, hit a new target level of what you want to be, and then you'll go up to that level. Make it 
obtainable goals and something you're doing it. Uh, my wife years ago said we were like a $5 million company. And my wife goes, in five years, we're going to hit 15 million. I'm like, Holy tamale, baby. Yeah, I, I got the, well, I'm We put it up on the wall. Reality. We put it on the wall so we could see it. We could do it. And it it didn't take five years. It, it was incredible. But again, one of my things is like, I was trying to be a realistic. Let's be realistic. We're growing at a 15 or 20% rate. Are we going to really make that goal where we're there? And are we making unattainable goals for our employees? And what would they look at us if we don't hit that goal? But again, it was us. It wasn't them. Yeah. They they wanted to champion behind us and to get us to where we got to go. And it was me that was saying, hey, we're going to hold back. But now I don't think that at all. I'm like, uh, oh, no problem. You want to buy that? Let's go buy it. Let's get it. Let's make it happen. Let's like, we know it's going to come. We know that we have that energy to take it to that next level. And we know that we're going to make it happen. And because that, that's what we do. And we don't have those limited beliefs. Don't get me wrong. I don't think I can fly. I'm not going to go try and jump off a bridge or something. I think I can fly. But I believe that if I had a parachute, I would land. You know, if you believe that you can do it and you find a way to do it, you're going to make it happen. You know, and I think a big piece of that is in our previous episode, we were talking about the importance of being in a group. How you combat those limiting beliefs is you surround yourself with others who also believe in the potential that you have. And you are maybe not sharing with your aunt or uncle who are constantly like, oh, don't do that. That's crazy. You're losing your mind. Like maybe you don't share everything with them, but you have your group that you're like, this is what I'm working on. This is tra the trajectory that we're headed. And you're hearing, you're, you're stacking on that, that positivity and you're doing less of the, neg the negative vibe or the negative words that are coming in through like other people that don't see the vision and don't support you. That's another piece to overcoming that. And I, I think you'll look in, in your social groups, you might be the one that is a little higher up than some of the other ones and they all look up to you or they talk mm -hmm. to you and they ask you a question. That's all great. I mean, we have s tons of people that we want to help and get to the mentorship, next level in yep. mentorship because people took time and invested into us. But the other part of it is that you have to be around people that are like-minded or above your minded too because as we are giving down to them we're hoping that the next level of the people that we're talking to are looking at the potential in us and willing to put time and effort into us because they feel it's the right thing to do too and we want to get to that next level and and that's we're hanging around like-minded people hanging around people that have the same beliefs as you i was talking to a couple of business owners just last night and talking about we should have our own little 2020 group up here that we all bounce stuff off and we get together once a month, we get together for a couple hours a day or whatever else it is, have everybody bounce ideas off it. Because when you're talking to some of these other owners that we're talking to, they don't have a lot of people that they can bounce ideas off to and do stuff with and they wanna make sure. So, hey, I know we're running time in this. We wanna make sure you go into our next segment. We're getting up this time, but hey, thank you guys so much. There's so much more that we can offer you this. Please ask questions, please ask what you want yes. to. We're here for you. We are taking the time out to, we want to give back to you guys too. And that's why we're doing these podcasts. That's why we're doing these YouTube videos. We want to get a good audience that we can get and help you guys get to your next evolution, stage. your next yep. stage. Yep. Yep. So we'll see you next time. Go to raiseupmindset.com. You can submit questions there or you can um, just check out our, our uh, previous episodes. A lot of you guys know us. You can DM us too and ask us any messages or questions you have and we want to help. Yeah, so thank you. Bye.